the overall theme for the manifesto launch for the N NDC. So they're calling it the change to reset Ghana. And they say they're focusing on justice, jobs, and prosperity. You heard him refer to that ambulance uh, trial that uh, quite recently caused a lot of havoc and eventually was also closed officially in court. And so they'll be focusing on what they can do to ensure that there's justice um, for every Ghanaian and also the creation of jobs and mm. you know positioning us for prosperity, which is very important. Um, absolutely. And I mean, it tells the thinking that the NDC is taking into this particular event. And the point is, you have some form of advantage if you're a minority party putting together a manifesto. Uh, basically, they are going to update us on what they've done in terms of the 2016-2020 manifestos. Mm. They're also going to seek to include things that people have raised about the governance structure, concerns that they have, make sure that all those things reflect in the manifesto. And we know that uh, the flag bearer, John Ramani Mama, the former president, had indicated that he had gone on a tour to listen to the views of Ghanaians. And so in a sim similar manner, uh, what the, the People's Manifesto, which they had Christine exactly. some years back, we are expect to see a manifesto that follows suit in that particular matter mm. to fill it in. And, and, and so it's interesting there. And the, the bit about the corruption that he touched mm. on, I, I found it curious because the surveys, some of which we'll be touching on mm -hmm. much later on, mm -hmm. increasingly points to the fact that corruption is really not an issue that people exactly. are concerned in terms of what they want to mm -hmm. have influence them in terms of their voting choices. They tend to lean towards issues of the economy and mm -hmm. we know that the economy because of how things have been in the last couple of years and they would also want to look at a job creation more specifically as a subsector of the economy but mm -hmm. all those are matters that will find expression in the NDC manifesto. Absolutely and at least if you look at the and you make reference to some of the surveys and rankings as well you see jobs jobs coming in tops amongst a number of age groups uh, that for instance the global info analytics surveyed from 18 to 25 25 to 34, 34 to 4, 45, all of them talking about jobs being the major priority. And there's a good reason why. You're, you're graduating so thousands of people. In fact, the last time I checked the World Bank document, this was sometime in 2015, they made reference to a number of graduates across the tertiary you know, institutions, not just the universities, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the nursing training colleges, teachers, teaching college of education and so on, over 150,000 people, young people graduated from all of these tertiary institutions on a yearly basis. Yeah. How many jobs opportunities or vacancies are created to us to absorb these number of persons? And how much of uh, an environment have we created for entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. for these young people to also be able to dream and create jobs and employ other people? So when you hear governments gone by and present talk about the enabling environment to uh, also to encourage young people to be innovative and create more jobs. Bearing in mind that the former finance minister was very clear and honest with all of us that the, the public payroll, government payroll is full. Yeah. This was sometime in 2022 that the over 650,000 people that are on the government payroll, that's it. Because of the state of the economy that we find ourselves in, says government cannot take up anything more. Mm -hmm. And so all of the Vacancies that were, as it were, existing at the time is what is being filled now. That's why a lot of people raise questions about, for instance, the, the number of jobs that the, 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 MPP, the MPP says exactly. they have created 2.3 million and the specific breakdown that the vice president gave in that Excel spreadsheet sometime in 2022 and so mm -hmm. on. So if we hear the NDC, for instance, talk about creation of jobs as well, then you raise questions about how that's going to be done. Exactly. Because if you are training 1 million people in coding, what is the plan after you train them? How do you intend to empower the private sector to absorb them mm -hmm. so that they put it to good use? If you're going to pay level 100, you know, costs for, you know, university entrance oh, into sure. the public universities. Yeah. I think the emphasis now is I think they've disaggregated that promise, broken it down for us all to understand that they're going to start from the level 100s in public universities. So then the question is, can, do we have the resources to fund that? The education analysts like Kofi Asari and others have indicated it is indeed possible. I'm using this mm. expression, it is possible, bearing in mind <laughs> what, 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 what that means. But then again, they say that based on at least if we, if we decap the GET fund, then would have enough resources to be able to fund that. Yeah, but absolutely. beyond level 100, then what next? Mm. I think we've yes. succeeded in just shifting uh, the, the problem. And I'm sure, mm. Bella, you, you would agree with that. I mean, you know, it started with a free senior high school policy. Exactly. Uh, if you want to go a step back, you realize that we also switched from the four year, first we moved from three years 
to four years. Mm -hmm. Then we came back to three years again. So it meant that there was a shorter period where people were staying in school. Mm -hmm. Then we decided that, look, a lot more people need to go. They were dropping out. So we mm -hmm. brought in free SHS. The numbers went up significantly. So now the bottleneck has shifted. So a lot of people are seeking admission into the universities. And that is how come mm -hmm. during the NDC uh, Youth Manifesto, the former president, did also indicate about even providing accommodation facilities yeah. at the universities. Mm -hmm. Then comes the free policy that they also talked about because they now want to absorb more people there. But in doing all of this, the up, upstairs one, job creation is really mm -hmm. not not much is happening at that level. And exactly. So we have a ticking time bomb on our hands. Which is why, you know, I, I sort of lean towards the G GTP sometimes when you read, you know, their manifesto as well, because they have sort of come up with a solution as to how they can address job creation in the meantime. And they're saying that, especially when we're not creating quality from our secondary schools into the universities, how about you give them that one year window where they get into the job sector and intern in various sectors of the economy. And that way they're able to decide from that point whether they want to go into entrepreneurship or want to continue with you know, the tertiary education. And that also builds them and prepares them for the job market. Because whether we like it or not, there have been a number of reports that indicate that we're not matching our education with yeah. the job sector. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of students who are coming out of school but they have no technical knowledge of what happens in the job market. So they go there and it's as if they're starting education all over again, because you literally learn on the job. Yeah. What yeah. are we doing to ensure that we're able to prepare students adequately for the job market? It's very important that we look at that. And so if you look at all these promises that are being made, you're also asking that question that, yes, we're saying we're creating jobs, but how are we ensuring that our educational sector is also matching the jobs that are required. Right now we're talking about AI, and I like the both of them. In fact, if you look at the NDC and the NPP, they're all talking about you know, internet and AI and trying to prepare students and young people for that sector because mm -hmm. everybody's talking about preparing one million youth either for coding or for ICT. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good idea. Hopefully, it will take a while, but hopefully we'll be able to address that issue because we have 1.9 million young people yeah. who have no training, they have no jobs, they're literally home in yeah. this. Yeah, That's absolutely. what the, the statistic says. And you realize that they're also very big on the youth. If you look at the statistics from the 2020 general elections, we're told that out of those who registered about 17 million or so, we had about 10 million of these people who had registered between the ages of 18 and 35 years. And so that makes a chunk of young people who really had a say, probably the biggest say in the elections in the previous um, mm. you know, general elections. So, so that tells you why, for all the parties, they're heavily centered on young people creating jobs and addressing the specific needs of these young people. And let's see if that's going to make any difference in the 2024 general elections. Alfred? And rightly so. And we'll find out if the NDC's strategy of carving out a youth manifesto, you know, to spell out the specific details that of the promises they have for young people is also going to make any, any difference for them in as to attracting young people um, into their fold and also to align and vote for them. Musa Dankwa, Executive Director of Global Info Analytics, is joined us now. He's been doing quite some work ahead of today. Musa, it's good to have you. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Thank you for having Fantastic. me. Fantastic. And, 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 and let's go on to the, the, the trends. Just to understand even why the central region was chosen and how that dovetails into other aspects of the NDC's own vision, especially Joseph taking into consideration the positive flat that the NDC has had with the central region over the period. The recent one in history is John Evans at Tamil's the late. We have the current minority leader also from the central region mm -hmm. and the running mate of the party also from the central region. But how does the trend in history look like? I mean, you, you make the point rightly, and uh, the central region is one region that many would describe as a swing region. I prefer to call them, it's a battleground, because those are the regions where you fight, you win, and you know that once you win, you are headed to the Jubilee House. And like you did indicate, the central region has always had an interesting relationship with the NDC. We can look at what we have here, 881. Eight elections so far since 92, eight tickets, one region. The central region has always been an ever-present region on the NDC's ticket at every point in time. Either the presidential candidate of the NDC or the vice presidential candidate is from the central region. So we can look at the specifics here. You saw here in 1992, the running mate was calling Ken Saka. Mm. Uh, the stop one cut, like he was nicknamed, a very interesting point there because he was originally not with the NDC. He was from the National Convention Party. They entered into an alliance with the NDC together with the Every Ghanaian Living Everywhere Party. Mm -hmm. And so that alliance is what brought him in as the running mate. Interestingly, for the 1996 elections where Professor Mills joins as the NDC's running mate, he became the running mate for the then uh, candidate, John Ajikum mm -hmm. So it's a very <laughs> interesting situation that we had over there. But Konkensa Akai's constituency, he had been a member of parliament 
a for a futu e wutu senya the foot to arise where the Winnebat thing is taking place previously. That was under the Liman regime. He was a member of parliament for a foot for PNP, that's Liman's party. But still with Professor Mills, 2000, 2004, 2008, he became the flag bearer. So central region still ever present. Then for 2012, uh, Park Resi, Mr. Arthur became the running mate. Then for uh, 2016 and 2020, you have uh, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajiman coming in. And we know that for 2024, which is the next elections, uh, she will be on the ticket again. So central region being present all throughout. But what has it brought about for the NDC? Uh, one will make the point that, well, look, it doesn't seem to have yielded too much for them in terms of their electoral fortunes there. And so that is an interesting one that we have to pay attention to at this point in time. And so we have to look at the numbers and what it appears to be doing for the MP NDC. Yeah. So you just simply look at the spreadsheet of the data that we have available and you see quite clearly that it's not a case that the NDC is doing well. It's just simply a region that whoever is winning the national elections is picking it up. And you can see from 2000, you can do the runoff again, mm. can go all over the way to 2020. You just simply see that the central region sticks to the person who wins the elections. And so it's no surprise that they intend to go there. And even particularly if you are even going to talk about the Futu constituency, Alexander Fenemarkis constituency, yeah. it's a constituency that the NDC believes they can take back from him. And the reason being that they always had it. I mean, they had it in 92, 96. They picked it up in 2000. They lost it in 2004. The MPP came, the NDC came back in 2008, then Afenia Martin comes in 2012. And, and he's held it so since. since then. So if he wins it one more time, he's at equal level with the NPP in terms mm. of the number of times, then he can begin to make a case to make it look like an NDC seat. Uh, James Kofi Annan is the NDC's parliamentary candidate for that particular constituency. He previously worked in the civil society space, uh, trying to help children. Uh, so he was not particularly a member of the NDC, but he was brought into eventually, and he's working towards getting the seat for the NDC. We know that that will be very difficult because the majority leader is quite an important parliamentarian. He takes mm -hmm. his constituency work very, very yes, serious. Yes. And if you talk to a lot of people who uh, live within the Winneba area, they talk about how uh, many jobs he's creating for young people there, the development in the area, the road construction, all that other things that have been taking place in that mm. particular area. There, there's something that I noticed, and it, it, it also repeated itself in the Western region when we're taking a look at the history of votes in the Western region as well. You realize that even though it's also a swing region, when they've had to vote for the, you know, for the NPP, it seems as if the ND, NPP had had more votes in the history as compared to the NDC. And we're seeing the same, the same thing happen here as well. Because you look yeah. at the NPP, and at one time, the highest that we've ever had in that uh, region was 66.4%. And that mm. was for um, former President Kufuor. Yeah. Now, you don't see the M NDC having such high numbers in the Western region. You come to the Central region as well, yeah. and you see the same trend because... Even though the NDC has also had its turn in, in ruling in the central region or, you know, winning the votes, the NPP seems to have had the highest number of votes in the central region in 2000 in the runoff. And that's 60.3%. Yeah. So what does it really say about, you know, these two areas and the fact that when they've gone all out for the NPP, they've really just shown their, you know, their love for them absolutely as compared to the NDC. Could you say that as well? I mean, I think for the NDC, if they look at this data and they would make the observation that you've rightly mm. made, I mean, especially because of the fact that there's always someone from the central region never present on their tickets. Yeah. And the yeah. question would be that it appears that those candidates may not have been able to successfully galvanize the numbers for them, mm. particularly even in times when they are winning. And the MPP will look at it and say that, look, it means that we have the comparative advantage there. But the point is that it's a battleground to be won, and mm. that is how come you ought to take the fight there. You ought to make the people feel that they are individuals, that you have policies and programs that could change their lives and you could convince them to get on board and make you their choice. Mm -hmm. uh, we, it's difficult to explain just from the, looking at the raw spreadsheet as to what is accounting for that significant change because, I mean, we see that 60.3% is the highest that the MPP gets from there. If you look at the NDC side of things, 55.2 is here. That's basically the highest that they've gotten. From that particular region. But if you so see the decline as well from the yeah. NDC, it started from the year 2000. Mm -hmm. 92, 96 years, they maintained their hold in there. But if you look at the decline and, and the gap that you're looking at as well, it, it widens from the runoff, is it not? Mm -hmm. from, from the 49, 43.3. 43.5, yeah. then they slide down to 39.8. See the margin of increase for the MPP, 60.3 mm. after the runoff in the year 2000. Just that slight decrease did not necessarily kneel to the benefit of the NDC. If you look at it in 2004, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you see that, that sharp rise as well. So you, you can see the trend analysis that even though the NDC is gaining, wherever the MPP gains in terms of the marginal loss, it does not really go to the benefit of the NDC in mm -hmm. terms of even if they make gains. The, the NPP still maintains a certain hold. 
within that constituency. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why another issue also will, will, will do a, yeah. a takeaway. But then in the year 2020, and I always say that the 2020 elections is an outlier for a lot of the analysis, and, and Mr. Dankwa is here to, to also point to that. You see a lot of skirt and blouse. Yeah. In the year 2020, in that in in, in the central region. I mean, I mean, I think I think if you are going to look at the central region in terms of the outcomes, particularly this case, you're referring to the parliamentary as against the presidential. Mm -hmm. I think we ought to again separate the 2020 election because uh, that is a year that the parliamentary makeup does not reflect the national elections at all across the country. I mean, for the first time, we went into a parliamentary elections. The, we exited, and both parties were tied at the same level. I mean, if the trend that we have generally was to continue, it would have meant that the MPP ordinarily should have had an advantage in Parliament, but they didn't have that. And so then the, the 2020 elections with regards to the parliamentary was quite complicated, and that is also presents another fair opportunity for how things will look in Parliament going into the 2024 polls, mm -hmm. because it means that both sides of the House have the opportunity to seek to form the majority. And the thing about the parliamentary elections is it's very difficult to tell who is winning at any point in time, mm -hmm. unlike the presidential, where we are just putting together what is coming from everywhere and we are seeing a trend. For the parliamentary, you basically have to see the results from everywhere before we know who has formed the majority. Unless in the early stages of coalition, you have someone crossing a certain threshold and you can safely conclude that it looks like they, they will be forming the majority in parliament. So, so they really don't care if you come from their region, from clearly what, what's happening. Because if you go back again, and we'll bring in Musa down quite shortly, but back again to the year 2000, that yeah. was when uh, the late President Mills had now taken over yeah. as the leader of the party. And so between 2000 and 2004, he was supposed to have had the highest votes, if you're thinking of where one person comes from. And he comes from the central region, yeah. a very proud one at that. But that's when they had the lowest number of votes as well. And so it really doesn't make a difference for them whether you come from there or not. Until maybe recently when Nana Jane in 2020 was able to increase the numbers by some 2% or so in the central region. And so th that's also the concern now that many people are, are raising because, again, they were not doing too well in 2016 and then she was able to raise it in 2020. Doesn't mean that her re-election or her reappointment as, you know, the vice presidential candidate for the NDC will probably increase the numbers again for them in the 2024 general elections, you never know. I mean, if we are just going to strictly go according mm. to the, the trend and the cycle that we see here, then we always see that uh, the mm. change. So if you pick 2000, both the 2000 era runoff, there's a change in government. Mm -hmm. So you see that the MPP wins. Mm -hmm. So 2008, we again the NDC, we see that happen. 2016, yeah. if you come back to 2012, the same. If you go to 2016, then if the eight year trend will tell you that in 2024, maybe the NDC maybe. should be picking it up <laughs> and then they would also win the central region. But those are <laughs> matters that uh, you can't tell from this and, point and, in time. And, and if you look at, I mean, this is why we we'll probably just bring you in at yeah. this point about, for instance, the trend of the, of the skirt and blouse. And just for the benefit of the uninitiated, the skirt and blouse are instances where the, there is a parliamentary candidate who, who wins the constituency, who is not a member of the person who wins the presidential in that election or vice versa. So, for instance, in Cape Coast North, right, if you look at Cape Coast North constituency, there is, mm -hmm. there is Kwame Nami Tanya Akonde who won that constituency on the ticket of the NDC with uh, a little over 22,900 votes. Yeah. Then, Nana Duranko Ekufuado won the presidential there with over 24,300 votes as well. You come to a, a Kumfi constituency, Aguna East, Asin North, and, and Goma Central. We're seeing that trend as well. Based on your anal analysis, is this going to repeat itself or the trend is going to change? I mean, from the early data we have seen, um, there will be skirt and blouse, but it wouldn't be skirt and blouse that will cause what we saw in 2020 election. Mm. It wouldn't be to that magnitude? No, no. Um, we have seen skirt and blouse in areas where um, MPP PCs are doing better than their presidential candidates. Mm. The MPP parliamentary candidates are, are doing, doing better, better than, than Dr. Bamia. Yes, and this is normally happening in the MPP strongholds. Mm. We saw what uh, happened in Okanikwe South, uh, Okanikwe Central. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw um, what happened in Anyasotu and Trobo. Those trends are consistent. Mm. So you would see their MPs at performing Baumia during the 2024 elections mm. in many of the areas that MPP is very strong at. But in the other areas that we have seen, it's quite normal, normal race. 
when you say normal race, and so that means that they whoever voting, they are voting for, yeah, they are yes. still voting for the presidential yeah. candidates yeah. in that area yes, yes. as well. But but you've just put out a poll on you know the central region, mm. and you call this the telephone poll. Can you explain to us exactly what that means? That means you didn't go in there to sample the people directly. You did it via phone. Okay. First, we went there at a certain point in time yeah. to do different polls, mm. and we picked their numbers. Okay. And we called them back, just for those in central region. And we spoke to them over the phone. And what, what were the details? What did you get out of that conversation with them? Um, basically to see how the region is going to vote uh, in the upcoming elections. Um, if you look at um, what we shared, the headline polling numbers, mm -hmm. um, we expect John Mahama to probably win central region if he wins the election. Mm. That's your verdict? Yes. And this you put out on the 13th of August? Yes. Okay. So uh, give us, uh, uh, I mean, how, how many persons were sampled in this telephone survey and what exactly was it? We're looking about five, what were you five, asking them? No, the same question we asked nationally, but here it was focused on central region. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the key questions that were, were coming out, which gives you an indication of what could happen. 77% said Ghana was in the wrong direction. 77%. Only 14% said right direction. So oh. these are early warning that you pick from any polling that you conduct. Mm. And then you go to um, uh, the performance of the president. 71% disapprove mm. compared to 23% who approve his performance. But these are early warnings. Don't wait for the election. Wait and see what people are saying about setting key data from the polling. And then if you look at um, issue with regard to standard of living of people, which is going to be Crucial in this election. I mean, we had a report from the Lord Africa saying that the economy and people's standard of living will determine the outcome of this election. And it's consistent with what we've done. 74% of voters in Central Region say that their living standard has gotten worse compared to a year ago. 14% said it hasn't changed. Mm. Only 11 said it has improved. So yeah. these are numbers that should be worrying uh, for the ruling government, if, mm. if you want to win central region, mm. then you ask them who they want to vote for, and then the results are there. Okay, now let, let, let's flip that chart because we have um, that the details of this poll that you put out. Uh, uh, Joseph, what do we have? Okay, so the question that you were touching on earlier on had to do with the issue of if the 2024 elections were held today, who would you vote for? Uh, that is all voters model for central region. And so we see here John Dramani Mahama uh, getting 40. 5.4%. Then you also have Dr. Mahmoud Baumia doing 25.6%. Uh, then Alan Kujit Chiamanti, 1.5%. Uh, Nana Kwame Bidiako, 1.8%. Uh, the others is doing 03 14.0, and 10.7%. For those who are saying they will not vote. And maybe I'll just uh, take Mr. Danko's views on this. If you look from this side all the way to this mm -hmm. period here, wouldn't you say that this is quite significant? You're looking at 1.5, 1.8, 0.3, 14.0. 10.7. Basically, not opting for any of the two candidates here. And particularly, if you look at undecided and those who are saying, oh, look, in simple terms, they are not going to vote. Yes, they are not vote is quite significant. Almost 11%. And these are mostly MPP voters. That's the worrying thing for MPP. The higher I will not vote, it's not NDC guys, they are MPP voters. So in the questioning, they state their political affiliation. Yes, yeah, yeah, we analyze okay. the political party affiliation. Okay. You, you know who they are. And then those who said they are at the moment undecided, they are waiting to see what, what probably they, uh, they will see down the road. They could be waiting for manifesto, mm. many other things. Sometimes some people who want to hide their true voting intention, they say, oh, me, I'm undecided. But what we normally see is that when they are deciding, they will decide the way the race is looking. Mm. They won't overturn the race. Uh, how about Nana Kwame Bediako? Quite interesting here. He's doing better than Alan, Alan Kojo exactly. Yeah, I mean... Bidiaku does better than Alan Chilamatin in Central Region and Greater Accra, but Alan overtakes him in Eastern and, 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 and Ashanti Region. Um, he's normally popular among the youth, I mean, 18 to 24 years, and also probably around 30, low 30, 34 years old. That's where his uh, bulk of support comes from. And they are normally people who are either pro Mahama or pro Baumia that are disappointed. So you can see that. His vote normally swing between him and, and, and Baumia, but largely between him and Mahama. I mean, also, let's look at the gap here. I mean, I, I don't foresee an election outcome that we are going to have the gap between 
the, no, no, this, the this, one who this is not the asking. This is the poll. This yes, yes, I, I understand. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm only, I'm only comparing it to generally how we vote in elections. Yeah, but you see, we are assuming we, we've always assumed that yes, election will be like the same thing that we've seen before. Yeah, this is always first time. Mm. We've never had close one million vote in twenty an election in Ghana before. Yeah. We had that in twenty twelve. This election will deliver something else. Mm. I see. And I, and I look at, you see, then I know quite a you know, reference you make there. This week we got information. They've gone to pick their forms. Now the Electoral Commission is not recognizing their movements. Mm. They, are, they are picking forms as independent, independent presidential candidates for that matter. Uh, you described Nana Kwambediako as an exceptional independent presidential candidate. And so if we do a historical analysis of how independent presidential candidates have performed in our previous elections, mm -hmm. right from the first person who showed up, Jacob Osayabua, to the likes of um, Alfred Walker and so on, it, it hasn't been good. In fact, they've, been, they've not even gone, gotten more, up to 1% in any election. Is Nana Kwambediako going to break that? Break the break the one percent. <laughs> uh, you see, I always look into the future. We are in the Gen Z era, mm -hmm. where social media is making a lot of difference. TikTok. If you are on TikTok, you see what is happening in this election. Mm. But they are cool way of uh, uh, attracting voters. I know the traditional way that you see Mahama and Baumia do. They have their own constituency, and they appeal to them in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And the people who uh, like Bidiakum, our younger voters who are on social media playing. The problem he would have is how to convert those support into actual votes right. on the election day. That's what his uh, problem would be. But he will certainly perform better than better. any of these social uh, influence. But if you talk about breaking the one, then mm -hmm. obviously Alan Chebati also seems to have gone beyond that 1.5% even in the central region. I mean, would you say that because his message has also been for the youth? basically, where he talks about even having a greater number of young people who will be appointed into positions if he should win. And so he's looking at 1.5% in this case. Is it because of his appeal to the youth as well? Is he even appealing to the young people? Uh, he doesn't appeal to the youth the same way um, Nana Kamedu Nana does. Uh, but if you look at his appeal strongly, it's in the um, Ashanti region, and then the Eastern region. Mm. That's where bulk of his support comes from. Um, if you look at the numbers we've seen so far, um, more than 50% of Alan Martin's voters are MPP supporters. Mm. The same way as Bidnano Kwambediako. So he's indeed going to have an impact on the NPP well, votes. I mean, absolutely. The yes. party has been consistent about that, that you know, he, he, he is a non factor I mean, I to mean, deal with. Sometimes we, we, we pretend to be delusional. You know, but the reality is that these are numbers from the ground. I mean, I think people who are kind of saying this election will be very close are those who are thinking that Alan will get probably 1%. Mm, I I see. They are working on that model that Alan will get 1%. So if he gets 1%, it means that all the uh, Bamiya votes are intact. Mm -hmm. But if Alan goes beyond that percentage, what does it mean for them? Yeah, but, and one percent is a big deal. I mean, if you mm -hmm. compare two thousand and eight, what happened? I mean, if Nana Dan Kakufara got to one percent, uh, the electoral election like sure would have been completely <laughs> yeah. different. So it's very mm -hmm. important. But uh, uh, there's this question I always like when the researchers ask, uh, trying to get into the minds of the voters on what is influencing that, and we see them asking this question here: What are the three most important issues that you would consider in a run-up to the 2024 elections when making choice as to who to vote for? And Bell earlier, I was telling you about corruption mm -hmm. and what it looks like. We see corruption again, very low here, just 5%. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we see it Job consistent with what you yeah. brought to us for Western Region, Mr. Mm -hmm. Ramka. You right. see jobs and the economy again, neck Talk and neck, 81, 80% 80 there. Uh, it appears it will be quite a big deal. Then education again follows. In fact, I think with all the data that we've seen, it's basically the same trend. Yes. All regions. I mean, yeah. so obviously the manifesto presentation today should center around. This three matters. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, if you're a political party worth your salt, you should be paying attention to the polls. And, and that, that should inform some of the pivotal policies that you put in your manifesto, obviously. Mm -hmm. Because at a time like this, because of the economic quagmire that we've had to experience over the period, where not only um, new graduates or fresh graduates looking for jobs, but there are people who have lost their jobs as a result of the state of the economy, and the, the, where they were working had to be closed down or downsized. Yeah. Uh, about 4,000, over 4,000 companies in the private sector in the year 2021, according to the Ghana Scout Service, between May and July, 
laid off people. We had close to 6,000 companies in the private sector within that same period also halving their staff strength. Mm. That also comes to compound the unemployment situation that we're talking about. So there's, it's not a surprise that the jobs is the number one you know, priority or expectation of the voting population. As to whether there are specific policies that can be able to address as another issue, because we're going into the year 2025, the, the economy obviously is not going to pick up as swiftly as expected. We're still under the IMF program, that's number one. The, the macroeconomic indicators are looking good. But then again, if you know the economic cycle, it takes a while oh, wow. yeah. to actually reflect yeah. mm -hmm. you know, in what you call the micro mm -hmm. yeah, indicators. And, and given, and and given they, that within that period is. also, we would have a situation where some of our commitments, you know, under <laughs> the uh, program that we entered, mm -hmm. domestic debt exchange and even the external in one, fact, some in of our commitments will we'll start due. paying our debts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. our debts. So it, it obviously, it's so Mr. Anko, it means that what people are expecting to happen with regards to the economy, and particularly jobs, they, I mean, I always like to connect the two. I mean, because if the economy is doing well, generally people that have the ability yeah. to quit. Now, that could be problematic. You'd agree with that. You know, what they are telling you is that today, this is our problem. Yeah. How do you intend to address it? Now, the manifestos will set out so many things that will seek to address jobs and economic situation. Then the question is, who do you trust to do it? Mm. And that's where it comes that's in. That's where it comes down to. But, but at the same time, as we keep looking at this, I always go back to corruption because I have never really understood why for some reason every time people are being asked what their you know, reasons for voting would be, mm -hmm. corruption seems to be either in the middle or towards the end. No. Even in central region is worse because you look at western region and at least 12.5% of the people said corruption was going to influence their votes. You look here and it's just 5%. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the political parties are also very focused on how they're going to ensure that they fight corruption. You look at GTP, they're talking about introducing the um, prosecution czar or something like mm -hmm. that. And then the NDC is also talking about how they're not going to let people who have been named in corruption scandals go free. The MPP is also looking at even strengthening you know, the office of the special prosecutor, etc. So for the political parties, they are focused on corruption. But at the same time, you look at the public and they tell you that corruption is really not even one of the things they're looking at. I think mm. it's a balancing act you need to play as a political party. All the issues we're having today are linked to corruption. Mm. So you can't ignore corruption. Oh. Even if it's not a priority of the voters. Because once you're able to... We'll, we'll let you hold on. Okay. Sorry. The cocoa sector yes. is uh, one of the we, major points. We've been first. talking about it all week. Uh, we actually have some data on the performance of cocoa board generally uh, right here with us here. So we see in terms of the production numbers and how it looks like. So for the year 2021-2022, crop season, we saw a decline there, 32% decline. And the, the previous year is when we had done almost a million tons. So now mm -hmm. we came down to 683,000. Mm -hmm. Then you pick the 2022-2023 crop season, a 4.2% decline coming to 654,000. Mm -hmm. Then for the 2023-2024, 580,000, 11.3%. Very significant drop if you look at the last couple of years. If you come to the financials of Cocoa Board, it tells quite even a more disturbing story here and you can see in terms of how that is looking specifically for the outcome in terms of what the country mm -hmm. is making. So you see 2017, this is the lost cocoa board recorded, 395 million CDs. If you come all the way to 2021, we see what is happening now. It begins to go to the billions, a loss of 2.4 billion CDs. Then for 2023, what, what we've come back to 4.2 billion CDs. And Alfred mm -hmm. and Bella, what is worrying about this is that for the 2024-2025 crop season, for the first time, we are not going for a syndicated loan. Yeah. Uh, the minority claims is because Cocoa Board is not credit worthy, but we heard government and Cocoa mm -hmm. Board explain that it's a decision that they have taken. And yeah. one will make the argument that that was always a good source of funds for the entire crop season. And with a loss of 4.2 billion that we are going into it with, the question is, will we bring this down or potentially there could be further losses? And it's not a surprise that Mr. Fusampo for touch on the issue of the In fact, there are fundamental questions about this option that the Cocoa Board has decided to, to, to go in for. It, 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 you know, policy-wise, it would make sense, obviously, because we, like the last year crop season, we paid a, load, a little over $150 million as interest on that syndicated loan that we took. So, yes, policy-wise, you would say financially prudent to do so. Mm -hmm. But then again, a number of factors come into play. Will the financial sector, as we have it now, have the, the muscle, the strength mm -hmm. to be able to raise more than $1.5 billion? for Cocoa Board 
for this next crop season because of what the financial sector has gone through over the period. A number of banks are having to recapitalize and so on, even the Bank of Ghana itself. That's number one. The, the operational issues that Cocoa Body itself has, mm -hmm. right, that has resulted in this loss that we're talking about. Even if the banks are going to be able to come together as, as a consortium for, of a sort or a syndication for that matter, to be able to raise this over 1.5 billion they need for this crop season. They are going to be looking at these losses and ask themselves yeah. whether Cocoa Bot will be able to pay them back on time and with their great interest for them to even be able to stay afloat as we speak. Because the cocoa sector, beyond what Cocoa, uh, cocoa Bot is talking about, it's bedeviled with a number of challenges, and yeah. we must face it. And that's why the position that Cocoa Board took, although they're trying to defend, but also I was expecting that actually there'll be an admission of the fact that all is not well in the sector. Exactly. We're talking about smuggling. We're talking about aging trees. We're talking about the welfare of farmers as well. And that's why you see some of them selling their farms to illegal miners, because they need their money. Also, talk about climate change and so on. So there are many other issues that are affecting the sector that mm. has to be looked at if we're even talking about right. other ways forward. Well, well, and if you just tuned in, this is your election command center, and it's all about the NDC's manifesto launch happening in Winneba in the central region, and we're here to give you all the updates on that. But, of course, we we're talking about the cocoa um, you know, sector and the challenges that we're facing mm. as well. Absolutely. And, and that's actually then, um, I, was, I was talking about how that also will influence especially um, voter choices in these cocoa growing areas, for instance, because I indicated that the, 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 the welfare of the cocoa farmer is also one of the major issues that has affected the decline or influenced the decline in cocoa production as we have seen over the period. And we see not only illegal mining, mm -hmm. or illegal miners forcefully taking over these um, cocoa farms. Some of the cocoa farmers are voluntarily mm -hmm. selling their farms mm -hmm. to these illegal miners because they would make money. Mm -hmm. And we have that interview with one of these cocoa farmers who yeah. said that, look, I've been farming cocoa for 20 years. I have made much more money in the last year or two than I had made or I had, he had made in 20 years of farming cocoa. Yeah. So they are looking at what they are earning as against what the illegal miners give to them. Mm -hmm. And so you recall that within this year, there was a huge conversation about the pricing mechanism that government uses, because now we're doing forward pricing. And so we're determining the prices of the cocoa even before, before. the crop season begins. Yeah. And then we pay the farmers ahead of time. There's an advantage to that pricing mechanism, because what that means is that if the actual price comes and it is lower than what government had agreed to pay the farmers, the farmers gain. But if what we are experiencing this year, for instance, that the, the forward price that was projected is actually lesser than what the actual price of cocoa, a ton of cocoa on the world market is, then the farmers lose. So there was a FOB pricing mechanism yeah. as well that also came in mm -hmm. into, into consideration. So all of this, we'll see how that influences voter I mean, choices. Let, let's forward. extend it beyond the cocoa farmers and bring in Mr. Dankwa because mm -hmm. of uh, the responses that we got, because we are basically talking about people's standard of living and the question that was asked generally about whether they believe the country is headed in the right direction or the wrong direction uh, we see 77 percent saying that they think the country is heading in the wrong direction 14 percent make the point about being the right direction then you have those who say that there is no opinion and uh, closely tied to that is do you approve or disapprove of the way Nanadan Kakufado is doing his job as president mm -hmm. we see 71 percent disapproving of that and 23 percent approving of that. And maybe Mr. Adamco can tie this in with your point earlier about corruption, mm -hmm. uh, because you get a sense that obviously people are not maybe leaning towards corruption as an issue because one, they think the country is not heading in the right direction, and number two, because they think the president is also not doing a good job. And so they are looking at what connects to them very early, like the cocoa farmers, living standards, they just feel that times are very hard for them. I think it's about priorities of a voter. Um, you have so many issues to uh, uh, tell us about, or we're asking you to give us two of those many things you have. So you are likely going to pick the top two that really bothers you, and those bother on jobs, economy, and education. Maybe corruption may be third, fourth, or fifth, but it won't find its way to the top of the ladder. Once you are hungry, I mean, you are struggling to survive. What if somebody is stealing sometimes doesn't really yeah. <laughs> bother you too much. Mm. Well, while we are at it, she's live here on your election command center. The
We are your election command center and just gone, but of course we had Alfredo Kansi with us from the beginning, but now he's had to take a leave. He's been on air since, what, 7 a.m., must be tired, but Kemini Amano joins us to continue Indeed. the conversation. Good morning, how are you? Uh, I'm good, and uh, we're going to have to add that Alfred will be back a little oh, he later. will be back. Yeah. For the yeah. Alfred fans who think that he's been <laughs> waxed out of this place, right? Exactly. But I think that this morning, it's good to see the likes of Mutawakilu over there. Mm -hmm. It would appear that... Uh, all those who have had gone into the background, the chickens have come home to exactly. roost. Uh, it may not be an appropriate one right now, but it makes sense, right? It yeah. does, absolutely. Uh, if you say the chickens have come home to roost, they are all there. And um, I think that it's a pivotal moment, just as it was for the, um, the NPP last weekend. And I look forward to hearing key issues. You know, last night I had a conversation with uh, Mustafa Bandi about the 24-hour economy. Mm -hmm. And I asked him that whether or not we are going to see proper in-depth explanation of the 24-hour economy. And we were talking earlier about, you know, yeah. living standards and all that. He, he, his response to me was that it is a, a opposite, uh, no, it is the ruling party's propaganda. Against that, them. That they are not explaining it, the 24-hour economy see that well. <laughs> a lot because you remember the interaction Mawena had with Edda Magwana, exactly. Mawena asked the same question. Mm -hmm about whether they've been able to explain it properly to make it simple for people to understand how that is going to happen. Yeah. His response was that, look, the NPP are the ones saying that that is not <laughs> possible and all of that. So it appears that is the position they are leaning towards. So, so they are blaming the NPP for not being able to explain necessarily. Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, or the fact the that they've explained, but the NPP, the NPP that refuses across the message that it is They've not, not been able properly. to explain it. Yes, but they think that they've explained it properly. N not to digress, by the way, I just wanted to ask about Muta Wakilu because I remember that ahead of the 2020 general elections, we had had a conversation with Musa Dankwa, and he had one of the polls he had predicted was the fact that he was going to lose his seat, especially because uh, Samuel Abu Jinapur was running in that constituency as well. I mean, after the elections, he clearly lost his seat, but he's come back again, hoping that he can win the seats the seat this time for the NDC. Is that even going to be possible? Uh, nothing is impossible, but from the numbers we have seen and we've run through the model,